Welcome back to Great Western Buildings. I'm Eric Beavers. In the last video, I mentioned a little bit about the line that we had coming in. Uh, you know, of course, delayed as it was. Uh, but we do have that line completely in. I'm actually standing in front of it right now. Um, in the last video, the pull through uh, was there, it was functional, but we were missing the middle part of the line here. And it's really, really ramped us up. Now, we did run into a few snags uh, with what I've been calling pandemic parts. Uh, little motors, little buyout things that are associated with the automation of this machine were basically uh, crapping out. Uh, the, 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 the problem that we wound up with that is that it, it, two years ago, these parts were on the shelf ready to get, um, and we struggled mightily to replace some of these bad parts. Uh, and it's not on Franklin, it's not on uh, the people we bought the machine from, and, and I really don't wanna blame it on Lincoln Electric, but um, more of like just the buyout gizmos, VFDs and stuff like that. Um, where we used to be able to get those right away, it, 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 you know, we had to scour the internet, make a hundred calls to replace these simple parts. But uh, fortunately, we got that, we got that done with. The machine's been functioning pretty much flawlessly for about two weeks now. And and let me tell you, the the, the capabilities of this machine and this whole liner, this you know, the, all of these machines put together, uh, is is really really impressive. Um, I mean, it outpaces what our, our actual volume has to be, or we have the ability to uh, really step that up well beyond what we need. Uh, so there's some good growth potential there. The middle part of the line came in with the submerged arc uh, web splicer and the, uh, and the flange conveyor and everything. We're still waiting on a couple of things, but they're really not slowing us down as far as production goes. We've just been able to work around it. Um, and you know, now that we're past the, the install issues, um, it, it's gone really well. In fact, uh, uh, this week, uh, we shipped out, I mean, some serious tonnage. Our piece count was down, but we had a couple of very large projects, you know, a couple hundred foot clear span where we're, you know, beams that weigh, you know, 2,500 pounds a piece and they're only, uh, you know, 18 feet long and stuff. So uh, it, it's been nice to see that. And the guys over there in welding and fitting uh, have been keeping right, uh, right up with it. Just takes a little bit more time because of the tonnage turning beams and everything on the, on the saw horses. And, and that pretty much wraps up uh, what I wanted to uh, do last last month, uh, which is show you guys this line. And it gives you a really good idea of how a three plate piece is actually put together uh, and, and why, it's, why we say it's different than an I-beam or a mill beam or a wide flange beam. Now, just real briefly, I'll talk about the, uh, the, the market update. So uh, there was some doom and gloom that I, I had brought up last month that was a little bit more negative than I thought, but I, I, I mentioned the, you know, compared to the analysis in the reports, like the, the talking heads and the analysts on online and in the magazines, um, we really weren't seeing that level of doom and gloom. And, and, and things have actually gone a lot better than that. The invasion seems to have maybe settled down or say, well, we're not seeing the, the, the massive, massive impacts on that. I mean, we saw steel shoot up, but it has uh, come back down gradually. And right now we're just about where we were pre-invasion, uh, you know, the Ukrainian invasion. Um, and that's been real good. We were real worried about allotments. A lot of the mills like we pumped the brakes, wouldn't, wouldn't write new orders. And those days are done. Hopefully it stays the same. Uh, so while still steel is still much, much higher uh, than it's historically been, you know, more than double, I would say, um, it, it is leveling off and it is becoming consistent with the, with the price and a lot more stable, right? It's still way up here, but it's not doing this kind of thing. Um, a little bit of problems with the, you know, post mill production from, you know, the, the coil coders and the, you know, and the product finishers. A lot of the product that we bring in is just isn't raw steel. It's, it's a finished product that gets roll formed or, or turned into purlin, you know, that we pre galvanize those. Those go to a, a, a separate uh, company from the mill and then we purchase that stuff from them. Now the, the, the coil coders and the finished product suppliers, yeah, they're really digging their heels in on these high margins. Um, and, and I expect that that's gonna continue for a couple of months, maybe you know, into the fall, but you know, it, it won't last forever. And the, uh, I, I really feel like once one of these big suppliers you know, these, these, you know, galvanizers or these uh, uh, paint coaters, once one of them blinks, 
it's just going to be a race to the bottom for the entire market. Uh, the residential coated products industry, uh, like like pole barn type stuff, uh, residential metal residential roofs, um, has has pretty much collapsed. And probably because everybody already did what they wanted to do as far as uh, upgrading their house or you know uh, building pole barns and stuff. And of course, the economy is retracting. You know, we've all heard that. So uh, there isn't as much. I don't know, demand because of, uh, because of all the funny money that was rolling around the economy in, in, in 2020 and 2021, you know, so people are starting to tighten their belts a little bit. And, and, and that's, you know, not a good thing for the economy, but it is a good thing for long-term steel pricing, right? That high, high demand and all of that pressure uh, just isn't there. In, in pre-engineered metal buildings, plenty of demand, lots of backlogs, as many of you guys know. Um, but uh, we will catch up. You know, we're going to be delayed from the, the agricultural and the residential markets um, in, in similar products probably by six to eight months. Uh, but we will enjoy, um, you know, uh, more affordable steel prices uh, because those mills or, or those suppliers, those formers will, will want to increase their, they're going to want to supplement what they've lost in those other markets. I said I was going to talk about the mess that is long haul trucking last month. And oh my gosh, you know, it's just something I, I have to bring up. Um, you know, b besides fuel prices, there's, there's new trailer shortages, there's new truck shortages. You know, semis is what we're talking about. Uh, one of our big, uh, you know, our main supplier or our main vendor for uh, long haul trucking uh, we used to do what we call trailer service, uh, where they drop empty trailers in the yard. We can live load them at our leisure and, or, or load them at our leisure. So it's not a live load. The truck comes in, drops off an empty trailer, picks up the one and, and they're gone. And, and, and what's going on there is they're out of trailers. The, the old ones that have had to come off the road because, you know, they don't last forever. Um, they're not able to replace them as fast, you know, so there's a big backlog in trailers. I was looking at a, a 40 foot class A gooseneck for some of our local deliveries. I got an eight month wait out of uh, PJ and Big Tex uh, to get the trailer that we want. Our trailer yard down here uh, where they sell stuff, they have nothing. They have some box trailers and some other stuff, but this, this heavy commercial stuff um, just isn't there. So that's putting an impact on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we wind up in situations where we're, we're struggling to get trucks underneath of our loads. It's caused, you know, they don't cause like massive delays, weak delays or something, but you know, we'll have a confirmation from a, from a broker or from a dispatcher that the, the truck's gonna be in and the truck never shows up. Uh, you know, when we've lost those loads, it's because the driver or the company or whatever wound up finding a, a more profitable load, or at least that's what I think. They'll never admit to this, but um, I, I'm pretty sure it's happened. Now that things are getting a little bit more competitive and are gonna to continue to do so, uh, you know, those problems are probably behind us. So now it's just about finding quality drivers. A, a lot of the old timers um, and real high-end drivers, uh, you know, with a lot of experience, they seem to have retired or gotten out of trucking altogether or moved into different positions within their companies. Um, they're still struggling a little bit with that, but you know, no big deal. Um, as always, build great. If you have any questions or you want to stop by for a plant tour, uh, give us a call, let us know, and we'll, uh, we'll set that up for you. See ya.